I'd like to talk a little bit about why we're interested in band theory and, and then uh, look at the free electron model and how the free electron model can be modified to incorporate uh, uh, band theory. So, you know, the free electron model that we, we saw for sodium and, and lithium and the other ideal metals, uh, it works well in many cases, but it's, it's not really satisfactory to describe uh, a lot of the world. For example, uh, non-S valent metals, right? We start talking about, uh, you know, tungsten. Tungsten has, you know, very poor electrical conductivity. Uh, why is that? Right, it is a metal and it is conductive, but it's not nearly as conductive as many other metals that are uh, near it. So to understand that, we have to look at uh, a band theory of, of solids. Uh, we also can't make the distinction between metals and insulators or semiconductors without a uh, band theory. So if you think about the resistivity, the resistivity of a metal, this is around uh, 10 to the minus 10 ohm meter, sorry, ohm centimeter. And an insulator is around 10 to the plus 22 ohm centimeter. Right? So this gives us 10 to the 32 difference in the conductivities. And that's absolutely you know, astronomical. And it really is astronomical. If you think about you know, the distance from the Earth to the Sun, that's 10 to the 11 meters. So that's less. And if you think about you know, atoms, Atoms are 10 to the minus 10 meters. So 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the 11, that's, you know, 10 to the 21. Uh, so the difference between atoms and, uh, you know, this distance to the sun is less than uh, the difference we see in uh, resistivities or conductivities in the world. So we've got these, uh, and actually what's really nice about this is this gives us a whole set of building blocks that have variable sizes that range from, you know, smaller than atoms to larger than the distance to the sun. But we can't explain this within the free electron model. We also can't explain negative Hall coefficients, and we do see negative Hall coefficients in, in several cases. And we can't explain the transport properties of semiconductors. So semiconductors are insulators that have a, a, a small band gap, but in order to understand their conductivities as a function of temperature, and more importantly, the impact of uh, dopants and impurities, we really need a band theory. And to put this in kind of a, a simple picture, If we have our energy levels and we have bands that are full, full, empty, then we have an insulator and if we have Full, half full uh, empty we have a metal and this is what we were looking at when we looked at the free electron model and we were talking about uh, we were talking about uh, uh, the thermal conductivity and the heat capacities and if we have, and actually there's, there's a, well, there's two ways to, to make a semi-metal. Uh, one way to make a semi-metal is to have two 
two bands that overlap slightly. If you have a situation like that, this is called this is a semi-metal. And it's a semi-metal because we know that at the band edge, within you know the ideal metal, the band edge looks something like that. So in both of these cases, we have an overlap in which we have a low density of states. Another way to make a semi-metal is to have a band which is entirely encapsulated in uh, this other band. And, and this is what you get when you have a, a, a transition metal. For example, tungsten. Tungsten, uh, the D states, they form their own band, and that band will sit inside of an SP band, and it uh, generally has, it creates what we call a pseudo gap in, in the band. Uh, semiconductors are just like insulators. However, you have a very small band gap. And if we take that semiconductor and we, oh, sorry, I'll leave that empty. And if we take this and we put in a dopant species, we're essentially adding a few states inside of the gap, which can contribute to the conduction band. So drawing these out in, in kind of a dispersion form, <clears throat> our ideal metal will give us E, sorry, density of states. This the Fermi energy there, and that's the ideal metal. A, a real metal, however, will have structures in its density of states that may look like We have a Fermi level. That sits there. And we have things like these, which are pseudo gaps that can come about uh, due to day state, uh, due to D states. So anytime that you have a uh, uh, real, anytime that you have a uh, uh, density of states that has this type of thing in it. And if the Fermi level sits in there, that's going to have the properties of a semi-metal. And then in the case of a, a semiconductor, semiconductors typically be something like that, or insulators, similarly. We know the band edges, they, they still tend to have the properties of uh, the ideal, and in terms of having this uh, square root of uh, E. Uh, and then the size of that gap gives us the, uh, whether it's an insulator or a semiconductor, and if we dope it, we're essentially adding a few states that are down here. And these states are close to the uh, empty conduction band, and they provide uh, means for uh, electrons to hop into that conduction band. 
due to thermal excitation. We can also have uh, p-type semiconductors in which we have uh, empty states here and we'll have uh, electrons that occupy the empty states leaving holes in the valence band and we can get semiconductors that carry current not through electrons but through the absence of electrons uh, or holes. So what I'd like to do today is I'd like to talk about expanding the free electron model to let us uh, understand the free electron model in kind of a greater context, how it fills the Brillouin zone, how you get bands from it, and then how you get band gaps that, that arise. So let, let's begin with uh, free electrons, which means we have uh, plane waves as our solution. So we've got the, the eigenfunctions and the eigenvalues associated with these electrons. And we also know from this, or not from this, but we know from the last several lectures that uh, we can represent this in, in K space and also within that, or reciprocal space, and also within that reciprocal space we have a lattice this, uh, say, D1 and B2, we have a set of lattice points, oh, that's not B1, sorry, this is B1, and this is B2, sorry, B1 and B2, each one of these points is equivalent, and we can break that down And if we represent our uh, energy in K space, we get some sphere. And all these spheres are equivalent. So we know, for example, that point, or that, that solution in uh, reciprocal space is equivalent to this solution, this, this, and all of these are connected through a lattice translation G, or a reciprocal lattice translation. Okay, uh, well the way I drew this, the way I drew this, I drew these circles, and the circles represent the occupied states, right? So that's the Fermi energy. But we know that the Fermi energy just represents the division between the full and the empty states. But you actually solve your problem, we solved our eigenvalues independent of the occupancy. So we know that this solution actually continues. So let's, uh, let's draw this in K space and just draw one, one dimension. Right, so let's have, uh, let's draw our Get a little darker pen here. Let's try it. Let's try it this way. So we'll just draw the kx direction, and we'll get something that does this. Right, this is our h bar squared over 2m 
k squared. It's a parabola. <clears throat> okay. And this is our, our zero, our reciprocal lattice point. Now, you can draw your entire band structure just like this. And if all you have is that single parabola, this is called the extended zone scheme. representation or whatever you want to call it, but that's how we represent it. And, you know, we'd have our, uh, let's, let's bring this in a little bit, two pi over a, two pi over a, four pi over a, 4 pi over a. And that's, that's one way to represent it. Uh, but we know, we know that we have more bands. We, we, if you want to, we can represent it uh, including the periodicity from the other bands. And then we'll keep this parabola, but then we'll also include the parabola that does this. this, and this, and this, And having this representation, in which we draw the parabola at our gamma point, and then at every other reciprocal lattice point, this is called a periodic zone representation. Or scheme or whatever. Uh, okay. And lastly, we don't have to actually include all of these, right? We'd run out of space. So what's more convenient is to create what's called the reduced zone scheme, in which we go here and this is going to be pi over a, and this is going to be pi over a. You draw up and then we erase these. So here, we have bands that come up, up, and then over here we have other bands that are coming in from the further out parabolas, but we're representing the, the first branch, which is from our gamma point, and then subsequent branches are coming from neighboring reciprocal lattice points. And this is called a reduced zone scheme. And we define what's called the Brewan zone. As the area uh, between our, uh, well, this pi over a and pi over a, that's the midway point between our reciprocal point of interest 
and neighboring reciprocal points. Turns out as you get to more complex, uh, so I just drew this as kind of a simple square, and if you have a, a square reciprocal lattice, then your Brillouin zone is a, is a cube. Uh, as you go to reciprocal lattices, for example, the FCC and the BCC, you start winding up with more complex shapes because, uh, well, let me, uh, let me try to draw this a little bit. So if I extend it, for example, I'm going to stretch it in the x in the kx direction. Then, for me to draw the Brillouin zone around this one, I would have to draw the midway line between these two points. The midway line between these two points. And then the midway point between these. So that would give us something like, so we get corner cut off. So my Brillouin zone is going to look like this. Right? So you wind up changing the shape a little bit. But nonetheless, uh, this is the three one zone edge. And uh, that is the way to think about this. Now let, let's let's look at an example of a S valent metal in a simple cubic lattice. So take a numerical example. Let's say that we have a uh, a, a simple cubic metal that has last uh, vectors a1 is equal to uh, 1, 0, 0, uh, 3 times 10 to the minus 8 centimeter, a2 is equal to 0, 1, 0, a3 is equal to 0, 0, 1, 3 times 10 to the minus 8, 3 times 10 to the minus 8, centimeter. If we uh, calculate the reciprocal lattice, then we get B1, B2, B3. One, This is going to be 2 pi over 3 times 10 to the 8, 2 pi over 3 times 10 to the 8, 2 pi over 3 times 10 to the 8, inverse centimeter. And uh, our charge density, based on this, Three times ten to the twenty second inverse centimeter cubed, and KF is equal to three pi rho to the one third, or one point one three times ten to the eight inverse centimeter. Okay. Now, representing our bands in a reduced zone, just taking into account the uh, kx direction, this is pi over a. Uh, our k Fermi is larger than pi over a, and here 
is 2 pi over a. So uh, pi over a <coughs> is 1.05 times 10 to the 8. Uh, Kf is 1.13 times 10 to the 8 inverse centimeters. And 2 pi over a is uh, 2.094 times 10 to the 8 inverse centimeter. So if we just treat these as though they are uh, a free electron, which is, is not a bad approximation for an S-valent uh, metal, That is our E Fermi. And what we need to do is we need to take this band and fold it in to give us Something like that. I'm going to erase these now. So if you want to think about the occupancy, these are full. And this band is partially full as well. And then it's empty above the Fermi energy. So schematically, I think you can see how this type of representation works. This type of, of uh, zone folding this type of zone folding uh, I drew this for uh, you know our uh, simple structure but it actually continues and, and if you if you want to think about this uh, in terms of the uh, Brillouin zone, or the Brillouin space, right? We have some uh, let me uh, I think it's an easier way to draw this. This way. Okay. So this is our our uh, reciprocal space. Again, this is a, a, a simple cubic uh, structure. Now, in this simple cubic structure, we would represent this as our first space. Then the next contribution is going to be This. And that comes about because we drew our lines which 
bisect the distance between these next points. So that means that this region here that that region will also be in our second Brewan zone because it's between this point and the next nearest neighbor. Uh, extending this outward, extending this outward, we'll get a third Brewan zone that sits here. This is our third rewind zone. And it goes on and outward, fourth, fifth, sixth, and just keeps going to higher levels. Now, the interesting thing about this is, is that all of these can be folded in to the Brewon zone. So, for example, when I showed you that going from the extended zone to the uh, reduced zone, we folded that, uh, folded that uh, parabola in. Well, I can take this. And I can fold it into here. So if I wanted to, I can represent that so I fold that in, that in, that in, that in, and I can represent this second zone or the second you know level of those bands as being inside of my first zone, but just up a level. And I can do the same thing with these. Right? So if you think about it, these are being represented as these. So if I calculate my parabola or whatever shape my uh, uh, solution comes out to be, and then I have some type of origami in which I, I fold those in, the way that you know, some curvature out in this third zone folds in is going to be, let's see if I have some plus, it's going to be something like this. So it allows us to have some type of uh, symmetry that, that, that pulls all of this together. Now, uh, this folding also means it has implications for our uh, Fermi surface. So the Fermi surface, that's where K Fermi sits. And let's, uh, well, let's, I'm just gonna erase this and start over. I'll, I'll, I'll just have a simple one here. It gets a lot more complicated, but So let's say I've got my uh, uh, reciprocal lattice point here, and this is the edge of my Brillouin zone. This is, uh, uh, again, a simple cubic Brillouin zone. And let's say that I have a Fermi surface that does this. Again, I'm treating this as a, as a nice free electron uh, model. Well, what it gives us is it gives us uh, okay. it gives us Fermi surface in two different Brillouin zones. So for example, in the first Brillouin zone, our Fermi surface looks like this. You know, just touch the edge so that's not a surface. This is our surface. And then in our 
uh, second Briwan zone, we would take, flip these back over, That would be our second Bruan zone. We have these surfaces. And what's significant about this, remember, is that when we talk about these Fermi surfaces, the surfaces are where electrons are become free to conduct. They become free to uh, they become free to uh, share. Uh, a carry energy for, say, uh, thermal transport or uh, heat capacity. And in these types of representations, we can talk about the morphology of these surfaces in reciprocal space. And Later, we'll, we'll talk about how this is significant and its impact on conductivity, but for now, I just want to demonstrate that, that this exists, and I want to demonstrate how it plays out uh, in terms of our... how it will play out in terms of our physical properties that we're interested in. It's noteworthy here that this is a metal, and, and the reason it's a metal is that it has a Fermi surface. And, and this is a, a fundamental definition. You know, uh, metals have Fermi surfaces. Exclamation point. I put an exclamation point in here because that's actually, you know, the fundamental definition of a metal. Uh, so, you know, someday, if you're ever teaching an uh, introduction to materials class and, you know, your textbook says, well, metals are, you know, shiny and conductive and blah, blah, blah. Ceramics are, you know, white and hard and brittle and non-conductive. That's not exactly right. And it it's kind of makes it challenging for you to, to try to teach these freshmen, you know, the difference between a metal and a ceramic because you know that the world's divided into metals and non-metals. And metals are purely defined by the existence of a Fermi surface. Uh, once you get rid of that, then you have a non-metal, which could be, you know, molecular solids or ceramics or, or what have you. Uh, but fu fundamentally, this is what makes a, a metal a metal. And interestingly enough, it's the fact that these complex morphologies uh, really dominate the electronic properties of metals that makes metals... Uh, fairly challenging to, to work with, uh, at least theoretically. So let, let's talk a little more about uh, implications of having these Brillouin zone boundaries. So you may remember from our discussion of uh, diffraction, that when k equals k b z e Brillouin zone edge, we have this uh, 2k dot g is equal to g whoops plus g squared equals zero gives us k dot g over two is equal to g over two squared. So when if k equals g over 2, i.e. if k is ever a bisector between two uh, points in our reciprocal lattice, anywhere along this surface, it satisfies the condition for diffraction. Well, when diffraction occurs, we have uh, 
actually a fairly special situation arise. Uh, what happens is that the uh, velocity of your wave goes to zero. So think about this. What, what's happening is that if you can move through k-space, right, and you calculate the group velocity of, of, of a wave packet as a function of its k-value, it scales with the value of k, right? But right as it touches the Brillouin zone edge, it goes to zero. And then, when you go across the Brillouin zone edge, you basically reflect onto the other side of the Brillouin zone, and now the sign of the electron is negative that it was before. So when we're touching the Brillouin zone edge, that's the point of zero, and then if you go past it, or if you go past it in, in iterating through your case space, then it uh, changes the sign. Uh, so some people like to say that an electron will reflect off of a Brillouin zone uh, edge or a surface. I am kind of uncomfortable with that because it implies some kinetics that I, I don't necessarily see as obvious, uh, but it does if we talk about changing that, that k value. So what does it mean that it goes to zero? Well, if you have a, a wave and you can you know, mess with an oscilloscope or, or MATLAB or whatever, and you keep changing your uh, k values and you, you, you watch these evolve, when you hit the Brillouin zone edge values, you're going to get a standing wave which means that the wave is no longer propagating, but it just stays in place and moves up and down. And, and that's what we occurs. So we have basically the condition in our x space, 0, a, 2a, 3a, of a perfect wavelength, like that, or like, oh, maybe, sorry, let's try that again. Like this. And this wave is no longer propagating, but just moving up and down. And if we, we look at that in our k-space representation, that occurs a, that occurs at our pi over a. Right? Think about it. K to pi over lambda. Uh, I apologize, I drew that wrong. If you actually work that out, 2 pi over a, 2 pi over lambda is equal to k, that actually should be 2a. Oh uh, yeah, okay, I got that right. It goes to 2a. Ha. So that is lambda. Okay, 
So we can have two different solutions, a sine and a cosine, and I'm going to represent this as uh, psi plus is cosine pi over a x and That means cosine 0 equals 1, cosine pi over a, a is equal to 1, and psi minus as sine pi over a, x, sine of 0 equals 0, sine of pi over a, a equals 0. So those are going to be our, our two standing wave solutions. Okay. So given that these are our solutions, we can calculate, we can calculate the uh, expectation values for the energies. Right? The expectation value for the energy or any operator. So this is going to be the expectation value for the positive solution. This is equal to psi plus star times the operator psi plus over psi plus star psi plus. Right? This is you know back from the first month of lecture, and e minus is equal to, actually you know what I'm going to do, I'm going to call this plus or minus, and then I'll just substitute in the minuses. So that this gives us our, our uh, uh, solution. Now, Ham our Hamiltonian is t plus v, that is going to be negative h squared over 2m del squared, and this is our atomic our external atomic potentials. Now, this external atomic potential uh, in our real space is going to be our 1 over our Coulomb potential. And something like that. But our Coulomb potential has an infinite range. It has a 1 over r decay, which means that we can't just include 1, but we actually have to include the contribution from every atom in the crystal. Uh, okay, well, how do we do that? We do that by representing it in a single periodic box and then expanding as a Fourier expansion. Remember, our Fourier expansions of anything is dependent on that any function being in an infinite periodic array of that function, right? So, you know, those of you that have used Fourier expansions for, uh, you know, solving problems, you know that at the, at, the, at the edges, sometimes you have problems if you don't have uh, matching. Uh, well, in this, in this case, uh, this is not going to be a problem. And what we're going to do, actually, is we're going to take a simplification. We're going to simplify this and simply yeah, translate this up here. And simply take the first, the first uh, term in the expansion. So 
let yeah, change from a V to a U because all through the rest of my notes I chose U. Uh, U x is equal to U U naught cosine two pi over a x. So remember that uh, what we're actually doing here is we're taking u r is equal to the sum over g u g e to the i g dot r, and then we're taking u g is equal to the integral over the unit cell of uh, dr u r e to the i g dot r. That's our uh, Fourier expansion, but if we take that and we truncate it just at the first point, then we just wind up with uh, a cosine. And, and this is kind of a handy, it's not a great approximation if you want to have something numerically accurate, but it will show you the, the general behavior of, of what will come out of this. So using this, we get a Hamiltonian that looks like uh, two M, and we're going to turn this into a one-dimensional one problem again. D e by e by e x squared squared plus u naught cosine 2 pi over a x. Okay. So now we've got our Hamiltonian. We've got our expression for the uh, expectation value of the energy. We have our eigenfunctions that are standing waves. So this is the solution at the Brillouin zone edge. And if we solve these, we get We get this, and you get the same thing for the, the negatives. Uh, and this turns into pi h bar squared over a m plus a u naught. And if you take the uh, negative, term, so e minus, you get pi h bar squared over a m minus a u naught, which means that the difference between those two, delta e is equal to uh, e plus minus e minus is equal to 2a u naught. So what this means is it means that where we had where we had a uh,
where we had our uh, two, this is going to be pi over a, and we had that crossing point. Well, that crossing point was degenerate, and the degeneracy gets lifted through this diffraction, and when it diffracts, we get something like this. And that's our delta E. Or I should put it, call this delta E here. So the delta E depends on the spacing between the atoms, and it depends on the uh, this u zero, which is the magnitude of the potential. Which again is just telling us that the the stronger the the, the uh, atomic potential on the electrons, the uh, the stronger the potential on the electrons, the uh, uh, greater uh, the gap. So this is where gaps come about in the free electron model. They come about due to being in a lattice. The lattice has uh, naturally a, a diffraction occurring because of the periodicity. And that periodicity opens up the gaps in the bands. As kind of an aside, I want to point out that this entire problem could also have been addressed using perturbation theory. So if we look at our, our Hamiltonian, what we actually had here for our Hamiltonian was h is equal to h naught plus h prime, that is negative h bar squared over 2m d dx, our known solutions. And then over here, we have u naught cosine 2 pi over a x as our perturbation term. Uh, if you want to go home and try that, you can, but to do so, you need to uh, go a little bit beyond what we've covered so far because uh, the perturbation theory I showed you was for non-degenerate cases. In the case of de degenerate perturbation theory, you need to uh, apply what's called the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization Schmidt orthonormalization, and basically what it does is it takes these two states, which are degenerate, and it makes certain that as you express them in your uh, perturbation theory, that they are both orthogonal and uh, properly normalized. Uh, if you do this at home, what you'll find is that after orthogonalization, you're going to wind up with, uh, and I'm using phi here. So I'm gonna, well, whatever, I'll, yeah, I'll leave it like this. As our first, second, and then you can put these uh, new orthonormal, uh, orthonormal uh, eigenfunctions into perturbation theory and directly get the solutions. So as I mentioned before, we know that 
we have something that does this. Like that. That the group velocity is the slope of the energy dispersion. So here we have the g equals zero. Hence, we have standing waves. Uh, and this whole process, it also directly impacts our understanding of the Fermi surfaces and the shape of the Fermi surfaces. So remember I had our, I'm going to draw our Brillouin zone like this. And I drew a ideal, uh, you know, metal. this. Oftentimes this actually extends out in the third, fourth, fifth Brillouin zone. Uh, well, what's important is that now if we look at, for example, in here, where I've got my uh, my uh, uh, Fermi surface uh, interacting with the zone boundary. At the zone boundary, we have the diffraction. The diffraction occurs, it results in a standing wave, and what that does essentially is it turns these two shapes like this. So now, where the Fermi surface intersects the Brillouin zone edge, it intersects at 90 degree angles. So again, Vg is equal to zero. So the, the shapes, as I said, the shapes are, are typically fairly complex. Uh, well, they're not just complex because of the uh, nature of, of the, the band folding, the Brillouin zone, you know, kind of odd structure, and the uh, uh, the folding of the bands, but it, it also depends on uh, the perturbations due to uh, diffraction at, at the edges. And this is uh, kind of an overview of uh, band theory. Right? Band theory, we've seen uh, if you have a tight binding model and you've got uh, Bloch's theorem due to periodicity, we have uh, bands that have gaps between them. Uh, if we have a chronic pennant model in which you have a free electron gas and you have very small perturbations, we open up regions where there's an allowed solution and where there's not an allowed solution. And in the case of metals, we'll have these Fermi surfaces, and due to diffraction at the zone boundaries, uh, we get opening up of gaps. Because we have, uh, basically, it's, it's a point where the sign of the electron velocity changes as we, we change the value of K. Uh, 